I'm glad everyone got uh, their coffee because Doug and I are going to tech it up a little bit. Um, I wish everything I'm going to show you was just pictures, but I am going to show you a couple of things that have, you know, small numbers and regressions and that sort of thing. So, um, so uh, thanks for this opportunity, uh, Ray. So first, uh, I think in order to talk about identifying effective teachers or how to make our teacher workforce more effective, we have to first say, well, what do we mean by effective? Um, because it's not at all clear, uh, I think, it, uh, when, you go, when you talk to different people, what they have in mind for that, for that exact term. So uh, effective can be an inputs-based concept, right? Um, it can be about observable actions or characteristics of teachers. Teachers are effective if they do these things. Teachers are effective if you know, they look like this. Um, but it can also be an outcomes-based concept. Right? Teachers who are effective are the teachers who produce this set of results for, for students. And those are two very different ways of looking at this teacher effectiveness, teacher quality issue. And we've, I think, uh, gone a bit, uh, we, we, we've gone from one side to the other recently, I think, in terms of the policy landscape. For a long time, we were thinking about qualifications, what a teacher looks like, and now we're moving towards you know, what do teachers do and what kinds of effects do they have on, on kids. Um, the recent work of economists uh, like myself and like Doug and other people, uh, we're focused on outcomes. Uh, and, and, you know, partly that's because we have no idea what good teaching looks like. Because we're not educators, we're economists. Um, but I think it also stems from this idea that it may be very difficult to understand what makes uh, uh, teachers good, and, uh, and, and we can certainly look at outcomes we care about and ask things like, um, do teachers matter and, and why? Um, we, we use what's called a value-added approach. Lots of, I'm sure everyone in this room has heard the term teacher value-added. I'm going to spend a little time talking about what we mean by that, because um, I think it's, kind of, it's important to have a deep understanding of what value-added is all about. Um, and, you know, one thing that it's important to realize is a lot of this research that I'm going to talk about is focusing on outcomes measured on standardized tests. Okay? To the extent that you hate standardized math and English assessments, you're going to say maybe this is all hogwash. You know, if, if Chancellor Klein was here, he'd say, I got kids in my city that can't do basic uh, math and they can't uh, read and write for their grade level, and I care about the kinds of things that are being assessed on these standardized statewide uh, tests. Uh, and, and if that's your view of the world, then you will care about. Uh, what we have to say. Um, the other thing to note is that most of the research comes from elementary and middle school students because that's where the tests are. Um, there's some recent work looking at high schools and the message isn't all that different in high schools. Uh, teachers are going to matter a lot. Value-added measures are going to work there. Uh, a little bit uh, more traction in high schools on saying certain teacher characteristics matter like you got to know calculus to teach calculus. Right? You have to know a lot of math to teach high school math. You may not have to be a math major to teach fifth grade math. Okay. Um, and then what, another thing that I want to talk about today is this movement to bring more rigorous analysis and outcomes-based analysis to eva teacher evaluation as uh, um, teacher evaluation as we conceive of it as someone in the back of a classroom observing someone teach. Okay, so it's not just a researcher at their computer thinking about value added and measuring it, but it's people actually watching people teach and saying, these teachers are doing a good job. How do we, you know, do, um, try to verify whether those, those methods of evaluation work by looking at student outcomes? Okay, uh, the basics of value added, what's it all about? Um, it's all about measuring actual performance, actual student outcomes, relative to some counterfactual expectation. Okay? Anybody can measure student outcomes. Right? All you need to know is how to use Excel right, or how to read a, uh, a school report card, and they'll tell you how many kids passed the test this year, or what was their average score, or how much did they gain from last year to this year. Measuring actual student outcomes is trivial. Okay? The key thing, though, is, well, is that good enough? Right? If 80% of the kids in my school passed the exam this year, is that excellent? Am I happy? Is that terrible? Am I mortified? It all depends on what your frame of reference is. What is your counterfactual expectation? How good would these kids have done had they attended a different school? Had I given them a different teacher? Had we not used this professional development program? Right? This is exactly plays into what Caroline was talking about. Well, how good would the charter schools kids have done had they stayed in the regular public schools? Well, 
to get our counterfactual expectation there, we look to the kids who were lotteried out. So in, in this teacher work, we're going to think about what, building that counterfactual uh, expectation. OK, let's just suppose for a moment that we know it. Someone hands it down from above. We just know for sure the counterfactual expectation for each child. What is value-added analysis uh, about? Well, we take a kid's actual level of achievement. OK? Let's call that, sorry, let's call that counterfactual A star. Right? That's the magic number. We know that's how the kid would have done had we given them, I don't know, the average teacher. And we want to know whether how this teacher is doing relative to some average teacher. Well, let's just subtract the expectation, A star, from the kid's actual achievement, which we can see in our Excel spreadsheet, and call that G, the gain that the kid made. Right? It may be positive, and it may be negative. Positive means the kid did better than we expected them to do. This teacher did a better job with that kid than the average teacher would have done. And if it's negative, then the teacher did worse than the average teacher. Well, then we just take all the Gs for all the individual kids. Let's average them all uh, across all the kids that this teacher taught. And that's that teacher's value added. On average, their kids did better or worse than they would have done had they been given, I don't know, the average teacher in the district. That's all there is to value added. Right? That's all there is to the math. However, how do we get a star? That's the problem. No one is going to drop it down from the heavens and tell us this is the kid's magic number. right? We have to figure out how to get that. We, the big question in all value-added work is setting up that counterfactual expectation, is figuring out how good this kid would have done if they had Mrs. Jones instead of Mrs. Smith. Okay? And typically, we're going to estimate that with data. That's, what we're, that's the approach we're going to take. So uh, one approach you can take, which is actually how the Boston Public Schools has started to implement their value-added analysis, take all the kids in the district, and if you have a big district like Boston or New York, you can do this, take all the kids in the district who had the same test scores as this kid last year, and ask how they did on the test. Right? That average performance of kids who looked like this kid last year, that's kind of our expectation. That's the average teacher. How did my kid do relative to, to that average? That's an example of how you can do it. Of course, the quality of the estimates that we get are going to depend on the quality of the data and the process that generates it. Right? The more information we have on these kids, the better job we're going, to, we're going to be able to do. If you set your expectations too low, you make the teacher look good. If you set your expectations too high, you make the teacher look bad. Okay? Um, there's some statistical problems here we might worry about. Right? Systematic sorting of students is one of them that gets brought up a lot. Okay? We're worried here about bias. We're worried about an unlucky teacher who year after year gets the hard to teach kids. They might not look so hard on paper, but boy, oh boy, Johnny is a pain in the butt, and this, kid always, you know, this teacher always gets the Johnnies of the world who make her life hard. That means she's going to look bad right? if we don't understand that. Okay? Sort of unfair treatment of teachers that's systematic, like the principal's friends are getting all the easy to teach kids. The second concern is instability of the value added estimate. People talk about this a lot. You know, how stable is this from year to year? Does this really give us a good handle on how good a teacher is? Right? And here, the, the, the issue isn't bias, it's just imprecision. We might be on average right when we, make, when we set up our value added, but year to year, we might get it wrong, and how, we don't know how, how, how noisy these things are. And if they are very noisy, then we worry about attaching real rewards and consequences. Right? Think about any profession. If someone says, you know, how many sales you make this year, that's going to determine your pay. And if that can vary lots from year to year based on you know, market conditions and things that are out of your control, you might worry about setting up a pace system like that. right? It's going to maybe be a, a poor motivational tool, and it means you're going to make a lot of mistakes in saying who's good and who's bad. So some basic findings. We find substantial variation in value added across teachers, and this is across studies looking in different states and different cities, different methodologies. They all come up with very similar answers. So about 0.1, so race value added in a, in a district by a standard deviation, kind of moving from the median teacher to the 80th percentile teacher, you're going to raise kids, kids' test scores by one-tenth to two-tenths of a standard deviation, which is a very big effect. So the effects that Caroline was finding, which say 0.08 standard deviations or 0.09 per year in a charter school, this is how much you get per year getting a better, getting a better teacher, 0.1 to 0.2. We get a little bit more variation in math than English, and just like in charter schools, it's, I think because kids get more of their math in school and they get reading other places. Uh, and most of the variation is actually within the schools. It's not just good teachers over there and bad teachers over there. Each school has their share of good and bad teachers. 
Now, the conclusion, I think, from a lot of the, 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 that uh, on some of the concerns is, I, I'd say, not totally warranted. I think that bias and precision are, are issues, but if you look at the people that have been looking at those two issues, the value adjustments appear to contain real power to predict teacher effectiveness as measured by uh, student achievement. St they're stable enough that we think they, they're giving us real information, and the bias is just not a big deal. Uh, overall, although for an individual teacher, for the one teacher that the Principal Jones hates, maybe this is an issue for you, but over a, a city, you know, over the, the thing of a city, this is not a big deal. Okay, so just to give you an impression of what I mean by this, this is real information. Okay, this is from a study that, that Doug did in LA. They paired up teachers, okay, uh, in schools, and they measured the value added of those teachers, of each, each, each of those teachers. And they said, well, one of these teachers has a better value added measure than the other. We think that that teacher is better. So let's line them up on the x-axis in terms of the difference between their two value added. So over here, these are pairs where one teacher was really better than the other, and the pairs down there are pairs where they were fairly close in their value added. And then they randomly assigned those teachers classrooms the following year. So they actually ran the kind of experiment that we'd love to run, right? And they, let's compare outcomes for those teachers, kids, next year. Just look to see what happens to those kids. Well, what you see here, okay, these, these gray dots are the difference in student achievement for those kids the next year. And what you see is if you plot a line through this cloud of dots, you get something that, whoops, that's the wrong button. That, you get something that looks kind of like a 45 degree line, right? Which means that when you, got, when you move to the pairs where one is supposed to be a lot better than the other, lo and behold, the difference in their kids' outcomes are a lot different. And if you go to the pairs where they didn't seem to be all that different in the beginning, the kids' outcomes aren't all that different a year later. Okay? Another way to look at this is think about the distribution of teachers, value-added measures that we've come up with in New York City. And we're going to break this into the bottom. Uh, so let's take two years of data on each teacher and let's use that to break them into sort of the bottom quartile and the top quartile of value-added. And then let's fast forward the clock and look at them in the following two years, in years three and four. What do we get? We get outcomes that look kind of like this, right? The bottom quartile, the kids assigned to the bottom quartile teachers are doing much worse on average than the kids assigned to the top quartile teachers. There's some noise in those estimates. So some people who we thought were bad are doing okay. Some people who we thought were good aren't doing so well. And if I can go back, you can see that, you know, here in the cloud of points, there's also some bouncing around, right? This isn't, these aren't perfect measures. But on average, they're getting things right in a big way. There's real information. Why should we get excited about this? Okay. Uh, why do we get excited about it? Why not just pick the good teachers and then we don't have to worry about all this stuff? And the reason, I think, is because it's not easy. Not because we don't think that's a good idea. So this is a, a, one of my favorite quotes. Why selection is the best means of improving the school system and the greatest lack of economy exists wherever teachers have been poorly chosen. Is David still here? Maybe not. Okay. This is the New York State Commissioner, circa 1932. Okay, so we've believed this for a long period of time. The issue is that that is really hard to do. Okay, it's really hard to just pick the people who are going to be uh, good teachers. TFAs in the room, we know they know this. Okay, decades of work have looked at you know types of certification, their graduate education, how well do they do in, in their graduate schools, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they've come up with very little to tell us about how we should be picking our 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 teachers. Okay? Um, I have a study with Doug and, and other people where we actually say, well, maybe it's because we've been looking in the wrong place. We've been looking at the easy things that school districts collect for us. Let's go out and collect a lot of new data on personality and content knowledge and IQ and a whole bunch of other stuff. And let's see if that gets us you know, the, the silver bullet we've been looking for. It turns out, no. There's no silver bullet in any of those things. And we kind of chose things based on a literature that said these things really work. Right? We get some moderate power if you pool all this information into an index. Right? You say, well, people who, who look great on all these characteristics, they do fair, you know, a fair bit better than people who look bad on all these characteristics. No silver bullet to tell us, though, who's going to be the best teacher. Okay, so that's why we get excited about value added, because it's something that we can hang our hat on and say, hey, if you did well here, we think you're going to do well over there. And we don't have that on selection. Um, well, why not just look at good teaching? Why do we have to run these statistical models at all? Why not just identify teachers that are likely to be effective through direct observation of teaching. And that's basically what we do in general, right? That's how teachers are typically evaluated, through classroom observation. And I'd say the answer is we should. 
right? There is actually very consistent evidence of research from research that evaluations of existing teachers are strongly related to gains in student achievements. Evaluations, rigorous evaluations that are based on multiple in-class observations by a trained evaluator. Okay, so we can see it, right? We can see it. We may not do anything with that information. Okay, we may not do anything with that. That's another matter, but we can we can see it. The research here also extends back nearly a century. Okay. Um, and, and there's a bunch of uh, recent papers looking at this, including some of my own work. Um, one thing that I want to point out, though, is the nice thing about this, these subjective, you know, I sit in the back of the class and I look at the teacher teach evaluations is you don't need any fancy mathematical equations to explain it to people, right? And teachers like that because they're not, they're not all of them taking econometrics, okay? It's not, it doesn't rely on complicated formula, which is important, perhaps. But I think it's important to point out that the details of evaluation, you know, present the same issues as the value-added analysis, right? The devil is in the details. So let's think about context. Does one size fit all? Can we evaluate all teachers using this one rubric? Focus. What goes on in the evaluation form? What are we going to evaluate teachers on, right? Is that going to narrow how they instruct and make them focus on some things to the detriment of others? Bias. Are all the evaluators fair and impartial? I don't know. Okay. Imprecision. You tell me you're going to watch me teach three times during a 180-day school year, and that's going to tell you how good a teacher I am? That's a very limited window, right? So maybe you're going to get good information, but it's not going to be perfect. You're not going to know my performance over the whole year by seeing me teach three times. So all the same issues that people raise, say value-added analysis has problems, come up here as well. They come up here as well, okay? But you don't need any math. Okay, so the last thing I want to, I want to get to is uh, to talk about some recent uh, work I've been doing uh, called a modest uh, proposal because Doug's going to in a minute. Um, one thing you might think about doing is providing value-added estimates to principals. Principals are entrusted with making personnel decisions. At least in some areas of the country, they are accountable for the performance of their schools, so they should care about whether a teacher is effective or not. And they can, uh, so, and, and why would you want to do this? Two, two things. First, you can help them with the problem of estimating a star. So let's say I'm a principal, and I got four fifth grade math teachers, and I got to decide did they do a good job this year. Well, let's say pass rates on the test went from 70 to 80 percent this year. Did they all do a great job? What do you think? Well, 10 percent more kids passed the test. That seems to be pretty good. But what if pass rates in the state went from 70 percent to 95 percent for kids who look like my kids? Then I might say, shoot, my, my <laughs> teachers did a, a bad job, right? So by the value-added estimates, especially thinking about a place like New York City, you, you, you can handle a lot more data and say to a principal, this is how your teachers have done relative to all teachers in the city who had similar classrooms, and that can be helpful, okay? So you help them with this problem of knowing what the right counterfactual is. But they help you, as the researcher or the, the statistician, with the problem of they can combine the, the value-added information with all the other information they have, like observation, to evaluate teachers. And they will know who got bad Johnny. They will know which teacher had a personal issue that year, right? Teacher got divorced. That's why their performance wasn't so good last year. And I don't think they're going to be bad next year because they've straightened their life out. Right? Value, a, a, a computer can't tell you that. Okay, so provide this stuff to principals and let them filter it. New York City's done this. It's called the teacher data reports. Okay? And they piloted it using a randomized control trial where they gave information, these teacher value added reports, to some principals and not to others. Okay? These treatment principals were, that were evaluating, they received reports and they received training around how to use these reports, uh, uh, not how to use them, but what goes into these reports, the methodology, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we are studying this uh, using uh, a bunch of uh, follow-up, baseline and follow-up surveys that we've done. And importantly, we asked the principals at baseline and follow-up, how do you think about this teacher, Mrs. Smith, in terms of her ability to raise student achievement in math and, and English language arts? Okay, so we're focusing on the, the elementary and middle school teachers who, who, for whom we can get the value-added estimates. Okay, so first I want to show you there's substantial variation at baseline in what principals think about teachers. Okay, so we asked them to evaluate them on a six-point scale from very poor to exceptional. And you can see that, okay, principals were a little bit generous, right? The modal outcome is very good. They like their teachers on average. But there's some considerable variation here. 
you know, what's the variation in formal, official teacher evaluation in New York City? People know? Are there six different points on the scale? How many points are there? There's two. What fraction of people get the higher rating of the two? 98%. So 98% satisfactory, 2% unsatisfactory. So if you thought that was what principals really thought about their teachers, you'd say, okay, that's fine. But I don't think that's what principals really think about their teachers, okay? All right, then we look at their value-added estimates of these teachers that got ranked differently. And what you see, so this goes from left to right, and it lines up perfectly, very poor, poor, fair, good, very good, exceptional. The average value-added of teachers as we move from left to right in terms of the principal's opinion moves in lockstep with what the value-added estimates say. Now, they're not perfectly aligned. There are some people who the principal thinks stinks who the value-added estimates say, well, their kids are, do, are improving a lot on these tests. And there's some teachers who the principal thought was exceptional who the value-added estimates say, we don't think they're doing, the, the, the teacher did so well. But on average, huge differences between the, 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 the teachers that the principal thought were bad and the, the teachers that the principal thought were very good at baseline. So those things line up. Okay, the, uh, I promised you some regression uh, tables, so I'll get to those and then I'm gonna wrap up. Were the treatment principal's evaluations affected by the value-added reports? Did the value-added reports actually have an impact on them? We have a randomized trial, so we can answer that question. Okay, so this is my regression table. For math, what we see is that the principals, uh, we're, we're, we're asking, we ask the principals again at the end of the year what they think this, about this teacher. So first of all, principals, you know, what their initial opinion was matters for what they say at the end of the year. So they stick to their guns a fair bit, but they thought in the beginning of the year, still what they think at the end. But if you look at the treatment group, people with higher value added ratings, now the principal thinks more, better of them. In the control group, you don't see that, which is good because they didn't get the reports. Okay. So now we think that, that, that it has a, 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 an impact there. Now we don't see that for English language arts. It's positive here and smaller there, but they're not statistically different. But one more cut that we take, which is interesting, is the value-added reports weren't all equal. Some teachers, it was based on very limited amount of data, and so for some teachers, it was based on a lot of data. And that the principals knew the confidence interval around the estimate. So we split the sample by which teachers had sort of tighter than median estimates and which teachers had looser than median estimates, right? So if we look at the people who had more precise estimates, we get bigger effects, okay, bigger difference between treatment and control than for the less precise uh, estimates for math. And for English, now we get statistically significant impacts. So for the, when you hand a teacher, when you hand the principal the value-added report and it was a precise value-added measure in English, they did incorporate that information and change their opinion about their teacher. Okay, so they found this information new they didn't just have it before, it wasn't superfluous, and it seems to be useful in their, in their um, deciding on their new evaluation. Okay, um, concluding, because um, I, I went a little bit over, I think, right? Identifying highly effective teachers is near impossible if all you have to go on is a CV. I think we know that, okay? And that means we have to look elsewhere for, for our information. Value added and in-class observation, I think, offer us potential insights uh, into this problem. Both, of course, are imperfect. Don't let, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Um, and so innovative <coughs> evaluation policies, and Doug will talk about one in a second, uh, that begin to harness this information can, <coughs> can raise teacher quality and improve it. So the idea is that kind of sets up, you know, we're talking about, in some sense, a lot of the discussion of the value added measures has been in a vacuum. It's been in the vacuum of, well, okay, they're noisy, they have these problems, but that depends, you know, if the problems are, are the problems serious given how we're going to use them. So what I want to talk about is a particular way you might use these to search for effective teachers if you've got this imperfect information. So, you know, think of the summary of what Jonah just said is all these teacher, this huge literature on teacher effects say hard to predict it higher, but you can partially predict it after higher with various measures value added or the in class. So, you know, because it's predictable after hire, there's been a lot of growing use of value added in particular ways. You have to identify teachers for pay, for promotion, for professional development. And you'll often hear people say, you know, well, wait a minute, these measures aren't ready for prime time, right? The, the current value estimated, they're too, they're too imprecise, they're gonna make too many mistakes, they can't be used for these kind of high stakes decisions. You can't say that without thinking about how you're gonna use them and actually think about their statistical properties. We often use imprecise measures to improve things. You don't ignore them and use no information instead of imprecise information. So what I want to do is 
basically think about how could these measures be used given their statistical properties and how aggressive should you be using those in a very stylized model, but it, it's going to give us an idea of, you know, in this stylized model, should we be aggressive? And, and it kind of gives an idea of the potential for the measures. I don't want to say there are going to be a lot of things left out of the model and stuff, but I want to give you this idea of, uh, that even given the limited reliability and the, the problems with the measures, uh, they have some potential to be used. So the, what I want to do is there's, I'm not going to talk about the search model, but I'm just thinking of a simple search model where you can think of teachers are searching for good, principals are searching for good teachers. And they, get, they don't know anything at higher, but they start seeing stuff over, over time. And your problem is you can, at any point, think about selecting a teacher. You know, so I'm gonna be doing this all through screening out ineffective teachers. And then, but then there's a cost to that because you've got to turn around and hire rookies, right? And, and, those, and rookies aren't as good in their first year. So it's trying to think, how should you trade that off? How, what's, the, you know, what's the right approach here? And basically, if I know the properties of the information, I can just go in and simulate this. And so we'll simulate and kind of say, what's the best strategy? And then I'll show you the results of those simulations. So uh, you know, we've got to know kind of what's the property of the data. And we're going to use uh, estimates that come from New York City and LA. It turns out they're very similar, kind of how much noise is in these, what's, you know, how, how ineffective is a rookie compared to a more experienced teacher. And based on those, simulate these gains from, that we might get from screening and the properties. How many, you know, how aggressive should you be in screening? Those kind of questions. Um, and then I want to think about, there are a bunch of questions that people always ask in this, you know, and that often come up in the debate, to think about what are the gains from things like, you know, people often say, oh, we need to observe teacher performance for more years. And this is done two ways. Some people say we have to get rid of tenure because we have to be able to continue, you know, observe teachers for a long time. Other people say, no, we have to, you can't, you know, uh, select a teacher after only one year of observation. You need two or three or four years to be more sure you'll be making mistakes. So I'm going to think about that question. Um, you know, the other thing is there's a lot of efforts right now to try and get more reliable information on teacher performance. So uh, I'm involved in a bunch of projects that are thinking about trying to get in cl you know, classroom observation in addition to value added, in addition to a bunch of other things, and put them together into a composite so that you really know. You know, in the first year, in one year, you could really know uh, who's effective. How valuable is that? What, what could, what, how would that help us if we're using this approach, this screening approach? And the last thing is, you know, even though nobody's been able to find it yet, you know, this idea that you know, the big problem here is we don't know at the time of hire, you know, how, how valuable would it be to get more reliable information at the time of hire? And not surprisingly, that should be pretty valuable. So you know, just to get a, an idea of what the magnitude is, if we're thinking about trying to get better information, how valuable is it to try and get it up front somehow? And uh, not sure how. So here's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of this, you know, these simulations are gonna maintain some things and then change other things and see, see how it matters. So, you know, how variable are the, the impacts of teachers on kids' test scores? I'm gonna use these numbers like Jonah said from 0.1 to 0.2 is kind of a standard deviation of the teacher effect. I'm gonna use in the middle 0.15. That's about, that's right in the middle of the LA and New York. Um, the turnover rate, you know, big issue is going to be if I decide I want to keep this teacher, how long do they stay around? Because I selected a good teacher, the payoff is that they're around for a lot of years. I'm picking 5% a year because that was about after you get past, you know, after you get tenure, that's about the average in New York City and LA, something like that. But then, you know, the other things that I'm going to start with but that will change over time is thinking about, you know, first, you say, let's just suppose we know nothing at hire. I'm just drawing random people from the applicant pool. So I don't really know anything. I've got to learn it all on the job. Uh, how reliable, so reliability is a measure of kind of, uh, if, whoops, if there's a certain amount of variation out there, some fraction of it is real, persistent, that'll still be there the next year, that this teacher will still be good, and some fraction is just noise. We're going to assume about 40%, which is what you see in, in most of the data. Another way to say that is, if I had this one annual performance measure and tried to predict the variation next year, I'd be able to predict 40% of the true differences in teacher with that measure, with just one. So, you know, I'm missing a lot. It's not perfect. It's going to make lots of mistakes. Um, you know, you need a cost of dismissing people. The key cost here, you know, we talk about hiring costs and, you know, the, the kind of, you know, the, the mechanical parts of hiring. The big cost here is that a new teacher is less effective in their first and second year. So 
you know, these are pretty typical, and these are the estimates in New York. You know, new t a new teacher relative to an average experienced teacher with three or more years has about 0.07 lower uh, value added, you know, in terms of student standard deviations. That, you know, if you try and translate that into dollars, that turns out to be a huge number. A standard deviation in terms of when predicting future earnings for one kid is worth roughly $100,000 in net present value of future earnings. So 0.07 over 20 kids in your classroom, that's about $100,000. That is a big hiring cost. And you know, it's going to swamp, turns out, any other kind of, you know, if you start saying, oh, it costs you know, some real money to like, bring people in and interview them. This is the big one. Um, and then I'm going to start out with saying, let's just take something really simple. You're going to observe people for one year, and you have to make the tenure decision after that one year of data. You know, that's not realistic, but that's just to keep it simple, and, to, and then we'll ask, go from there. And the idea is, you know, they're going to max, what's the, what are they trying to do? They're trying to have the best student achievement, the best value added in their teachers by screening out the ineffective teachers using this imperfect performance measure. So think of it, I get value added in the first year, I rank teachers, and the only decision is, how far do I go in terms of dismissing teachers? Do I dismiss 20%, 50%, 80%, what do I do? And that's the decision in this, in this simple base case. So the and it just gets you an extreme answer, right? This simple model, what I just laid out, which seems totally, you know, it shouldn't seem unreasonable, kind of as a setup, says you dismiss 80% of probationary teachers after that first year. You know, we saw that number and we were like, whoa. So let me explain what this is. So all we're doing is in this simulation is varying what proportion of teachers we dismiss after the first year based on, you know, working up that, what, how they did on their value added in the first year, which is noisy and makes all kinds of mistakes. The solid line is what's going to be, if you do this for a long time, on average, what's going to be the effectiveness of the teachers, which includes both the rookies and the teachers who you keep in your workforce. And what you see is, and the left axis tells you how high that gets, at the max, at 80%, you've increased the average value added of teachers by about 0.08, about the size that Caroline gets in the, and that's per year in the, in the, uh, uh, the charters, that's similar to the impact of the STAR experiment of reducing class size from you know, 24 to 15, that kind of number. Um, this other thing says the dotted line, and it's on the right axis, is the proportion of your workforce that will end up being rookies, and that's the cost you're paying, and it's up to about 20% by that point. You know, if you go much further, if you get really aggressive, you start having a lot of rookies, and that's the cost, and you don't want to go that far, because then it starts doing harm. Okay, so. Why dismiss? You know, what is it? Like when we first thought, we said, can't be right. You know, there must be a bug. Something's wrong. Why do you dismiss so many probationary teachers? It's because the difference in the teacher effects are so large and so persistent relative to these short-lived costs of hiring a new teacher. They just swamp everything. You know, these are, what it is is, you know, if you're in an industry where there's incredible variation in productivity of your workers, you, you know, you have to act on that. That's, it, at least in this kind of setting, you know, that is what's driving all this, and it's what's driving everybody to get interested in teacher effects. It's just these are really large, right? And you can think of it, the, even unreliable performance measures, they don't predict all that variation, but they predict enough. And the differences are so big, even if I'm only predicting half of it or 40% of it, it's enough that I should be, uh, you know, I should be acting. And you can think of it, the cost here is if I don't act on it, there's a big, I'm retaining an ineffective teacher for a long time. And so, you know, and, and I'm weighing that against this cost of dismissing an effective teacher, which gets me a rookie for one year. And it's, and that new rookie, you gotta remember, there's this big option value of new hires. It's not that that rookie's gonna be bad forever, right? For basically every five new hires in this, there's gonna be one highly effective that I keep. And so, you know, you can think about trading off this short-term cost of the four dismissed against a long-term benefit, and, you know, with a 5% turnover rate, the average teacher is there maybe 14, 15 years. That's a long trail of benefits for this early investment for this one who I keep and retain. So, you know, going back to the well to pull new, new teachers is pretty, effect, is, is pretty valuable here. You know, what's not, what's wrong here? Why would you not dismiss, you know, because 80% sounds a little extreme to me. This is why I said not so modest proposal. You know, so the first question is, well, maybe there's smaller benefits than we built in to this, to this model, right? 
What would cause smaller benefits? If there are much higher turnover rates. So in New York right now, it's about 5%. Some schools, of course, have more. And there's a big worry that if I start having excellent teachers and everyone knows that, and I'm selecting the, the best teachers, that they're going to get poached. Right? So you know, we're just assuming this is going to stay at 5%. A big issue is going to be, how can you keep them there once you, once you get them? And that's going to come back to kind of salary issues. Um, you know, it also may be that teacher, we're assuming these teacher differences persist into the future. Most of the evidence now is that they do. Uh, you know, and including, like, there's not a lot of evidence that professional development is able to change the ranking to help ineffective teachers become effective. So I think that's reasonable, but, you know, that's an issue, right? If you think these don't, that teachers change a lot, then I select a great teacher now, but they aren't great in three years. There's no evidence of that. Right now it looks like they still are. Um, the other thing floating around is, you know, once we make this very high stakes, these tests may get distorted, right? These perf whatever performance measure we're using, and it may not pick up real impacts anymore. The current evidence is that they measure real impacts, but it may not in the future. So you've got to be careful once it becomes high stakes. There may also be larger costs than we've built into hiring rookies. You know, the direct costs of recruiting and firing, this is just small. So, you know, you can't put in a big enough cost here to make a much difference in what this does because you already have that big cost of hiring a rookie. Uh, you know, you might say, well, you're going to need to up your recruiting. You're going to have 20% novices every year. Well, LA, when they went to small class size, uh, they quadrupled their hiring in one year, had no problem filling those slots, and the average value add of the teacher uh, hired after they started doing this to before was the same, right? So you didn't see any obvious decline, which is consistent with the idea that you don't know much at the time of hire. Um, the big issue, I think, in costs is you may, this, you may re, there may be higher pay required to offset the job insecurity and to keep people from leaving, right? Because they've been, all, they've been selected as excellent teachers and they're going to get coached by Scarsdale or whoever it is, right? So, and this is a particularly an issue. If you're starting, if you're requiring a lot of teacher training up front and people lose that if they don't get to stay around, that's a problem. So this, you know, really, this is going to, you know, if you did something like this, it's going to require a very different rethinking of how you get, how you recruit teachers. Um, you know, so few quick questions and then I'll wrap. Uh, can we, you know, first question, can we require, is it a good idea to require more time? So we require that teachers have to stay a second or third year and you can't uh, uh, get rid of them or dismiss them until after seeing at least two years or three years of data. This is what happens if you, you know, the first year, this was what the simulation I showed you, you get an average value of 0.8. If you wait two years, you're going to do worse. The average, because you're basically keeping around for an extra year, a lot of teachers who you know you want to dismiss. It's not going to change in a year, right? And the longer you go, the worse you do. So, you know, you fire less because now there's a much bigger cost of firing somebody because you're going to have to keep an you know, uh, ineffective teacher around for two or three years now. But it's not helping you. you know, Allowing, giving people the option of, the, of keeping some teachers around the second or third year, that's valuable. And especially a second year. So this was our where you had to get, you had to dismiss teachers after one year. If you go to two years, you can get that up a bit. Point, you know, and by three years, you're up to about 0.1 gain per year. But you know, very little after that. So getting two or three years, going beyond that, you get almost nothing. And the reason is, you know, and the dismissal rates are about the same. But what happens is, there's a you know, two-thirds of the teachers, it doesn't matter how long you have to wait, you know. After that first year, there's no reason to wait because it's so unlikely that you're going to get more information down the road that's going to change your mind, that it's time to go. And so what you see is kind of as you start lengthening the period for evaluating them, you basically start splitting hairs. You say, ah, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a group here, you know, so we'll take this 16%. If we go another year, we'll split them across two more years, you know, we'll keep a smaller and smaller fraction, we say, well, we're not quite sure about those last few. But it doesn't get you much gains after a while. Um, so the last two questions are, first, this is saying, what if we could make this annual performance measure, value added and, and the observational, more precise, more reliable, less noisy, so we'd really know after, after a year who's a good teacher. Um, as you, that's moving in this direction. The solid line is what happens to value added average value added in the workforce, so 40%, you're at about 0.8. If you had a perfect measure, suppose, you know, through all this stuff, we're, we know exactly who's effective after year one, you can get it up to about, you know, you can double it about 0.14. So 
So that's how good, you know, so it's valuable. That's, a, that's, that's certainly useful. Uh, and I think of this as kind of what like a lot of these projects are trying to do, get more, if more uh, better information about who's affected in the classroom. Um, you can see the turnover stuff. Uh, it turns out even with a very unreliable signal, a very unreliable information, you still end up wanting to be aggressive on dismissing teachers because these differences are so big relative to the hiring class. This one I think is interesting. This is saying, what if we instead said, let's, make, let's get better information before hire, at the time of hire. So when I'm evaluating 10 people for the job, I can actually do some sorting at that point before I have to bring them in and make them you know, be a rookie and all that. Um, and what happens there is this solid line on the left axis is what happens to the average value added. You know, if I had a perfect signal pre-hire, I'd do a lot better, right? And in fact, even a very weak signal pre-hire, you know, 20%, if I can predict 20% of, of kind of who's a good teacher, I do as well as having a perfect signal after hire. Because knowing this before you have to do the cost of the rookie is, you know, of having a rookie around is really valuable. It, doesn't, it still leaves a lot of information after hire that you want to sort out, so it doesn't help so much with what you necessarily want to do on the turnover front uh, in terms of dismissing teachers. So, you know, what's the bottom line of this? This potential gain is large, right? It, the, these kind of magnitudes are the same average annual achievement gains, you know, the, of 0.08 are like, you know, the lotteries, the charter schools, and the class size. Um, you know, if we have more reliable performance in information, we can double or triple, uh, you know, the potential gains. So there's, there's potential here. And the, the real message from this, which I think I didn't expect going in, is you know, really you want to select only the most effective teachers and do it quickly, right? You want to act fast. Um, you know, there may be practical rem reasons limiting the success, like you know, I was talking about, but, but this is the strategy. It's trying to get, trying to move quickly because you know, you know, you have plenty of information to act, right? Even though what we did was all focused on screening, I don't mean that because I think that's the only way to use this data, but we wanted to take one way that we could really think about clearly and work through it. You know, there are other uses out there that may, lead, may yield larger gains. You know, do, using this for professional development, using this for pay for performance. But within this model, we were just saying, it, let's suppose it's all about screening. And so, you know, that, that's the, you know, so, so I don't mean to say that this is it, but it sure points us towards saying, there's a lot of potential here to be more aggressive using this information, even though it is limited. So, good. No questions after that. <laughs> uh, I have a question. What will this do to the so what will this do to the culture or the profession of teaching? Is one cost or benefit? I actually have no idea. It's not. Uh, it's not exactly my profession. I mean, it's such a far cry from where we are now that it's I think difficult uh, to say. I think that one point that Doug did stress is. If you have a profession where only 20% of the people who start and make it even to the hiring stage for a year get to keep their jobs, then you're gonna have to pay people, and, and you make people go get certification before they can actually even take that risk of keeping their job, uh, you're gonna have to pay them a lot more money. But, so, but let's say you did two things. Let's say you opened up the gates, you didn't require people to go get a master's degree before they could teach, uh, and you, for people who did make it into the profession, that was a highly lucrative job, right? But that only 20% of the people made it through. Uh, I think that would have huge ramifications for how we think about teachers in our society, right? This would be the elite core uh, of uh, a people with this human capital property. They'd be very well compensated, highly selected group. Uh, it, would, it would make us, I think, move us somewhat towards where we see other countries, but they select uh, earlier on, right? The countries where you know the teachers are coming from the absolute highest performing uh, uh, academic achievers in their society. I mean, one way to say this is also it's really you know we're thinking of this within the current system, but this is kind of pushing towards saying trying to get this information as early as possible at a time where it's you know where people are willing to say let's give this a try. 
is, is really valuable. Get some signal, even a little signal, you know, early on, and then people can somehow, you know, maybe you could do this without teachers in the classroom. We don't know that, you know, through, you know, summer school or whatever, a tryout. You know, and if you can somehow work that ahead, you know, even as a way to get, you know, to start your educate your ed school, uh, that would be really valuable, is what this is. Saying. You know, and if I may, let's think about like Teach for America for a second. Right? They don't keep, you know, how many of your applicants make it into TFA? Not, not a very high proportion. And what do we think about people who make it in? Well, we have sort of respect for them. Now, partially that's because we've seen some impacts of TFA that are positive, but also just even before we knew anything about their impacts, we said, wow, this is an impressive group. They've made it through a big uh, trial. Uh, so I wouldn't, so, so there was a big article in the New York Times Magazine about this that I'm sure many of you read, and I got quoted as being the skeptic uh, <laughs> there. And I would, my, my reaction is, um, I haven't seen it done, right, in a reliable uh, evaluation setting, right? I think I would love it if we could teach people how to be great teachers. And I think there's some anecdotal suggestive evidence from, from what people are working on now that, hey, maybe we're onto something. Maybe we figured out some methods of saying, look, this is good teaching. And if you emulate these things, you will become a better teacher. I also think we know teachers must be able to be better because we see rookies being bad, right? So we didn't, they are different people three years later, but they have three years of real teaching experience and they're better. So I think there is a sense in which people can become better over time, but can we translate four years of teaching in a New York City public school into a training program? We don't know the answer to that yet, right? And right now, I don't think we've seen that from anyone. Um, have either of you guys looked at um, Michelle Ray and, and Jason Cameron's new teacher evaluation system? Is a combination of um, value added just you know, I think you know, it's it's going in the right direction. The key, I think, the key is to validate these systems. So you know, there are a lot of projects, Gates Foundation, others. I'm involved in a number of these that are trying to go in that direction. Where you start out by saying, okay, there's you know various ways, but you know we have value added. We have the teacher evaluation. We might have student or parent surveys. We might you know a lot of things. But then the issue is, how do I combine them? You know, how do I put those together, and how would I know that I did it right? So I think all the work now is about validating how you would combine those and then being sure that, like, for example, if you did another experiment like Tom and I did, where you now think you found a teacher who's really effective and a teacher who's not, if I take those two teachers and randomly assign them to classrooms, is it true? Or did we just kid ourselves? So, you know, I think it's great to use, and I'm, I, I would be absolutely shocked if in classroom evaluations weren't a big part of that measure. But if classroom evaluations or value added in the end didn't add anything to that measure, I'm not sure, I'm not sure they're that useful anymore. Right? We want to be sure that they're validated, that they predict things that we care about. And I want to be a little careful. You know, I don't only care about test scores. You know, if these predict that the kids say that they really thought this teacher got the most out of them or something, there are other dimensions that I might be interested in trying to that I, that I might want to use, you know, classroom observations or whatever on. But at least we want to validate on the same, this is predictive. It tells us who is, who is the teacher who's good at this in a kind of forward-looking, predictive way. Okay. So um, is it another way to interpret some of your results to, to say that what education schools are doing is not the best use of <laughs> potential teachers' time. Because after all, most teachers, to get just their basic certification in the United States, take uh, five years. That's, that's the most common. Some of them take even longer. And some of this process of learning about a teacher's uh, effectiveness could take place during this five years. There's no real reason why we have to wait 
until they're actually a rookie in the yeah. classroom in front of kids all by themselves yeah. to try and learn about this information. And it also suggests that whatever filtering they're doing in education schools is not effective at telling, at helping people predict for themselves whether they will be good teachers or not. Because if we really thought that everyone knew that they would be effective or ineffective and that all the ineffective people who know that they're going to be ineffective still went into teaching, I, 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 don't, I honestly don't think that's true. I think most people are surprised to find that they're ineffective. I don't think that they know that they're going to be terribly ineffective. So isn't this really uh, partly about why aren't ed schools doing more of the things that help yeah. them figure out who's going to be a good or bad teacher? Yeah. Can I and that, doesn't yes, that take away also I'm, the pain and the suffering from having to fire someone? <laughs> I'd actually say it, yeah. Uh, so to it, first, the average ed school seems to not be doing this. But I think you know, people are really interested now in can we look across different ways of being prepped and are some people more effective than others? You know, actually putting out, however they do it, more effective teachers. But I think the others, like I, I would think of this as when I, often when I think of the cost of doing that first year practice where, where a lot of people are gonna get dismissed at the end, relative to the cost of five years or four years of, of training, you know, ask any 35-year-old uh, woman who's thinking of going back to be a teacher after she's, uh, you know, after she's had a family, and that's a much more attractive, you know, one year and I get paid, and, and, and at the end, there's at least some chance I'll be a teacher versus the five-year investment. So I think you know, there's a real issue there. But ideally, they do it without actually having to have them in front of kids. We just don't know how to do that yet. Oh, yeah. I, I gather, uh, although I don't I'd like to make sure I'm right about this, that the, the part of this argument is that the school effects are relatively small compared to the teacher effects. But has anybody looked at the intersection between the schools at the top of Carolyn's graph and their effect on teacher effectiveness? Like, are there schools that know how to do this? I, so, that, so that's got a lot in it. Um, so I think that, that it is true that um, when we try to do the same kinds of analyses for uh, schools as we've done for teachers, just to ask how different are these outcomes, um, we don't find as much variation. Um, so the idea that um, schools regularly produce uh, much greater achievement gains than others. We have some evidence from the charter schools that some schools are doing much better than the average public school, um, but just the, the standard deviation is just not as big for schools as it is for teachers. And I have another study looking at principles, like does having a good principle matter? And it looks like having like an experienced principle gets you better outcomes than having like a rookie principle, but the differences are much, much smaller than they are for like, did you get assigned an experienced teacher versus a rookie teacher as a child? Um, so. I don't want to say that schools don't matter. They do. I don't think we have it. Like, I can't, uh, but they don't seem to matter nearly as much as, as teachers. That kind of gets at your first uh, question. Um, whether there are some schools that are just better at making teachers good, um, the thorny, it's a thorny problem to try to work out. But I do think there is an anecdotal sense that that may be true, that, that part of what the you know, uncommon schools and KIPP and other people do is they turn teachers into very effective instructors. You know, there's anecdotal evidence, and that's led people to do things like Teacher U, where the idea is like, you're gonna use the charter school as a training ground uh, for our own teachers and award them certification based on real teaching and not based on, on classroom uh, class grades and fulfilling a set of requirements. So, you know, I don't know if it's true, but there's, that's certainly the idea that's motivated some of these movements. And you know, I always, this is like a project that's been on the drawing board, and, and, but we've never gotten off the ground for a long time, is this idea of, you know, how do good schools do it? And you can imagine there being three ways, that it, the teachers right on year one are better, and then, after, you know, and that's where all the gain is, that they select, that teachers who are ineffective are much more likely to leave that school, or that everybody has much bigger improvements over their first two or three years, which would make you think there's something that they're training. I think just de developing some of those facts in a lot of districts would be of interest, right? Is that what's driving it there? Thanks for 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Good.